Welcome back. My name is Steve, your host. Today we're going to talk about pads and pad leveling and key corks in a very simplistic method. So if you're an experienced repadding a clarinet or saxophone, this probably isn't for you or you may learn something here, but there's going to be a very simplistic concept to grasp initially. So we're going to take a look at basically the angular aspect of pads to a pad cup using other examples and talk about a few things with that. So let's get right to it right now. What I want to first show is some adhesives that can be used for clarinet pads and saxophone pads and flutes also. There is your standard type of shellacs. Like this is an amber shellac, as we can tell. This is actually a black shellac. As you can see here, this is a white shellac. And we have clear shellac. Now, you can use them if you need specific colors, but the shellac should actually be under the pads and the pad cups, and you shouldn't actually see them anytime. But I prefer the way amber shellac sits in the key cup and the way it sticks. I think it's a slightly better than the other shellacs. I think the clear shellac seems to be a bit more stickier in a way. Well, that's just my experience. Your experience may vary. You may think they're all the same at some point. These are shellacs. There's also, you hear people talk about glue sticks. You can use glue sticks. I don't think these really allow you to float the pad as well. And we'll get to an example of what floating is in a very simplistic concept. And this is called French shellac over here. Um, and this is commonly used for flutes and the trill keys. You can also use them in clarinets if you want. What I normally do, though, before I actually use shellacs is I'll actually pulverize it. And we'll review why uh, later on. But basically, these are what you'll probably be using, either a shellacs or probably some form of glue sticks that's good for pads. Not just any glue sticks you can get from any type of uh, store or whatever, but there's some specific glue sticks you want to get for pads. So these are examples of adhesives. Now using some simple ideas here, I have a pad and I have this little cup we're gonna use as an example. Now when a clarinet or saxophone, the pad is on a post and on an arm and that pad works off of a fulcrum, so it works at an angle. When we install pads, we wanna make sure that when this comes towards the key, that it lands flat on the key and that you get a equal pressure around the entire pad from the cup or from the tone hole in this case. So what will happen, I'm using a saxophone here as an example, what you'll have is an impression going around the pad where the tone hole is you can see on this, consistently around the entire pad. Now this may sound easy, but many technicians in the very beginning have issues. Usually on the pivot when it comes down, what happens is, for instance, the inside of the pad, as it bends down, will hit the, will hit the tone hole first. Well, if that happens, what happens is they end up using key clamps and they force the pad flat. What happens is you get a real deep indentation on one side of the pad versus the other. And you can start getting sticky pads where it gets kind of stuck in there. So we have to learn to make sure that when the key comes down, that it doesn't hit the front either or either the sides or two sides. We have to make sure that comes down flat every single time. So angles up, comes down at an angle, bam, flat all the way around. And we use tools for that. Now there's a variety of tools that can be used. For saxophones, you'll see tools like these. 
these holes are basically the handle. The resonator to make sure it doesn't hit a resonator. Here's a different type of resonator. Let's use a smaller one. This allows us to move the pad around on top of an adhesive of a more somewhat liquid adhesive, not totally liquid, but where it has consistency and allows us to move it around. These are normally used for clarinet pads. But we have to remember every time we deal with a pad that it has come down consistently every single time to hit all around the tone hole at the same time. Like I mentioned, if it comes down first on the inside, we have a problem we have to then force the pad down and it'll be inconsistent. So it has come down and hit consistently every single time. And once you get installed properly, it won't be a problem. If one side hits first and it dries that way, we're gonna have a problem and we have to end up using key clamps to press it down and force it down, which will give us a big deep indentation on one side and a light indentation on the other. And over time, this may start sticking if it gets too far into the pad. So we have to think about how the pad interacts with the tone hole. We have to make sure it's flat every single time. And when that does, it makes it easy. Now, when we get to repadding, we're actually going to do on a clarinet, the register key and the trill keys first because they're independent or in a saxophone, we're gonna do the palm keys. Because the issue we're gonna have in down the road, now on a saxophone, the palm keys are independent of each other. Press one, only one opens. Other keys, like on the lower stack, you press the bottom key down, and if you notice, this key, and this key closes. That means we're going to have to set each pad the proper height. This, here, and here. Each key is going to have to be the proper height with the pad to close at the same time. Otherwise, we'll end up having a problem. Now, the height of the pad to the tone hole may cause two issues. One, if it's too close, it may sound stuffy and or it may sound flat, the note. If it's too close, two things that issue. One is the pad could be too high in the pad cup or two on the backside, The amount of cork that stops the key against the body could be too thick, or it could be both. So we have to think about that when we do pads, and that's why we're going to first do the trill keys on, or the palm keys on saxophone, the trill keys on the clarinet, and the register key first, because they're independent, and we can play with how high it opens without having to deal with keys that are linked by mechanism. Because once you get to keys linked by mechanisms, you better know what we're doing. Otherwise, we're really gonna have a problem. And on a clarinet, of course, register key is all by itself. And each trill key is by itself. We notice on the lower ring keys, this closes the top pad cup, but also up here with the link bridge here, moves the mechanism to close this key cup too. Here we have multiple things. When this key cup closes, we also wanna make sure that the ring keys are fairly flat. They're not too high off the chimneys and they're not too low below the chimneys. 
and that is controlled by the amount of cork right here and how thick the cork is. Of course, the cork under the bridge here allows it to sit tightly and properly close the key cup up here. And hopefully the key ring is flat to the chimney or the way the player prefers it to be. So like I said, we have to learn what we're doing first by using trill keys and register key or palm keys on saxophone. Because once we get to here, we have a lot of interference items, not just one key, one cup. We have to deal with this, the bridge, and the other keys up here to make sure they all close at the same time and close properly. And that they vent properly. We want to make sure there's enough space here where the air doesn't come out and it may start whistling or maybe too, too far closed. If it's too far closed, the key is going to sound stuffy. The note's going to sound stuffy and the note may be flat. So you have to make sure it has the proper venting so it's not flat and doesn't sound stuffy. All you may notice, all you may notice on the register key, it's not a square edge register key. It's actually sanded down around it so the air gets a quicker way to get out of the register area. I'm going to pretend that this cotton ball is our adhesive. What basically happens is we put the adhesive on the back of the pad and also in the key cup. And why it's still somewhat liquid, you know, we have the ability of taking some out, in which case it'll, low, it'll sit flatter in the key or put more in, you know, sit higher in the key. But why it's there, we have the option of using our tools and changing the angle like this or like this. And that's called floating a pad, moving around so it fits into the pad and flat with the tone hole. In this case, you have a tone hole. We wanna make sure it's flat with the tone hole and it doesn't stick up on one side. The only way to do that is you float the pad so it fits with the tone hole. So those are the basic concepts we wanted to review today because we have to understand what we're looking for when we start dealing with pads and tone holes. They have to be flat up to the tone hole. The proper adhesive, depth of adhesive, we, we don't want the pad sticking too far out of the key cup unless it's designed for that. And we don't want it sticking too far in the key cup. We want to just right. And the way you do that is you look at the instrument the way it is when it comes to you or the way it is currently and make note of it. You, could, you can measure it if you want, how far it sticks up out of the pad cup and keep those notes if this is really like your first or attempt or if you're really confused about how to do it. Measure everything as much as you can if you want. But that's very important that the pad goes flush against the tone hole without coming in at an angle on one side hitting first. We have to always keep that in mind. And also the cork on the back end of the key comes into play here. Take note of how thick that cork is. Usually we use 1 16th depending upon the instrument, the key, whatnot. You always want to take a look at what's there. If you want to replace it, you can. Uh, try to replace it with the same thickness or maybe a little bit thicker so you can actually sand it down using sandpaper later on. But as you move more towards doing a repad here, we are going to do either palm keys on the saxophone or the trill keys and register key first on a clarinet. We're gonna keep it very simple where there's only one key. Anyways, I hope that helped or give some information what we'll be doing in, the, in future episodes. And I want to give a real easy example of what we have to think about as you start dealing with pads in the key cups themselves. So like, share, subscribe, send your friends a link of this episode and the other episodes we're going to. We'll see you soon.